I think that I hope you come to see that as well. You might, okay, so you might be asking, what is uh, uh, um, what is um, expository preaching? Hey, thank you very much. Good. We good? We good? Sorry about that. That, that lens cap was a new thing. We just put that on there. Um, you know, and, and think about this. You know, think about this. Um, uh, I'm a little, a little, let me find my place here. Um, uh, what is expositional preaching? Um, you've got different definitions here. Uh, this, this is a good one here. Uh, where did it go? It's not there. I'll just read it to you. Um, uh, this is from actually from the guy who founded the Simeon Trust that I'm going to be a part of. Expositional preaching is empowered preaching that rightly submits the shape and emphasis of the sermon to the shape and emphasis of a biblical text. David Helm. You see the order there? The biblical text is what defines the sermon. Not the other way around. You know, we can come into a, we can come into a text like say Micah chapter six verse eight, you know we want to say God cares about social justice, and then He does, no doubt about that. And so we'll refer to this text frequently. You know, what is required of you, O man, but to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. That's there it is. But if we just pull that out of its context, we are missing the greater message that we will find in the book of Micah. And what, how God views social justice, how he wants it applied. So we're trying the best we can. And I like this definition, uh, especially um, from Tim Keller, the late Tim Keller. Uh, this is, it's, bear with me. I know this is a little academic, but this is important, folks. If your preacher is just preaching, you know, cotton candy every week, your diet, <laughs> you're going to get sick, right? We're going to try to get the meat, the potatoes. And so... I want you to understand what expositional preaching, expositional preaching is so you can make sure I'm doing it. Wait a minute. You're asking me to hold you, Pastor Dave, accountable? Yep. That's your job, guys. You've got a job when you come in. You're not just here to sit and listen. You're going to make sure to, to, to discern, indeed, if what we're doing up here is what God wants us to do. And I think this makes incredible amount of sense. Let's read it. Uh, I'll read it out loud, and you can just follow along. Please try, try the best you can to stick with me on this. Expository preaching grounds the message in the text so that all the sermon points are the points in the text. Makes sense. And it majors in the text, majors ideas. It aligns the interpretation of the text with the doctrinal truths of the rest of the Bible. It's a big context. And it always situates the passage within the Bible's narrative, showing how Christ is the final fulfillment of the text theme. It's all about Jesus. The main thing, keeping the main thing the main thing. And the main thing is Jesus and his gospel. So here we are today. And for time's sake, we are not going to read this very familiar passage. Uh, we're going to actually go through it verse by verse, but we're not going to read it right now. We're going to pick up uh, on, uh, on, on that shortly, shortly, just a minute. All right. So you with me? I'm sorry. You know, um, uh, again, I'm going to be giving you arguments for why I think exp expository preaching is the right way. Um, and, you know, I want you to think about that. But I, I believe expository preaching has the effect of affirming a high view of Scripture. You know, it makes the message about the text instead of the message about the, the preacher's pet peeve or, or something that catches interest. It, it prevents hobby horse preaching, dodging difficult passages, or reverting to sugar stick Cotton candy sermons. So Bible ex exposition allows the text to speak, which lets God himself speak. That is a weighty thing. To imagine that when you come to church on Sunday, God is speaking. And yet that's how, that's how the Bible, that's how revelation is set up. That's God's plan. Sure, he spoke to all these these, these the writers of the, of the New Testament, 39 writers are the New and Old Testament. He spoke with, to them, but they're no longer here. But we have a record of what he said, and now it's our job to go back in time, you know, get in that time machine, as it were, and find out what the original meaning was. And then come back in time and translate it to our modern ears. Whew, I got some work to do. 
Well, let's pray. Father, we just thank you today for your word and that you've preserved it through the centuries. The text we're looking at today is probably 2,500 years old. And yet uh, it is with us today. It is powerful today. It is relevant today. Wow. And yet uh, it, is, it, is, it is hidden unless the hard work, the study, the exposition isn't accomplished. And so today as we start this series throughout the coming weeks, uh, you would enable the preacher and, uh, to, to, to speak your word and that you would open our ears to hear your word, that you would encourage uh, the preacher, that you would pray for him and then pray for ourselves, Father, that this word, uh, this implanted word would indeed save our souls. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Jonah is a literary masterpiece by any definition, whether you're a believer or not. And it's an example of, there it is, satire, satire. Uh, you know satire more than you realize. Uh, satire is, um, here's a simple definition, is the art of making someone or something look ridiculous. <laughs> you know those political cartoons with the wild hair or the big nose or the red, the red or the orange look? You know what I'm talking about, right? <clears throat> satire is, again, it's trying to get laughter maybe. It's in order to embarrass somebody, to humble them maybe. Satire is kind of a positive thing or discredit. You know, say, no, this is not, this is not right. This should not be said. And so we use the, this, this, you know, use the irony involved, exaggeration. Uh, here's another definition, literary composition, in which verse of prose in which human folly or vice are held up to scorn and ridicule. We have, we have it uh, everywhere. Um, yeah. Here it is. Can you see this? Uh, there it is. Stay, stay, stay. Anyway, uh, I don't know when. I think when you when somebody else uses the the out, updates it, it just m moves all the slides around, and it's just it's crazy. Anyway, so there it is. Can you see it? Can you see it? Zombies with their phones. Anybody find that funny? Yeah, true, true, right? All right. So. Uh, some historical background here uh, as we go to our as we go to J Jonah, um, and as we uncover the original meaning, we want to understand the history. Uh, who wrote Jonah? We're not we're not told, although we have a, I have a feeling that it is the um, it was it was told to Jonah if he didn't if he wasn't the author him, himself. Um, but we really we don't know. But Jonah was a real was a real prophet. He really, this is a real story. Jonah was a prophet during King Jeroboam II, who lived in the 8th century BC, a long time ago. He's mentioned by name in 2 Kings chapter 14. And so it could have been written um, during his life. It could have been written maybe even as early as the 3rd century BC. We just don't know. But it, it, we want to emphasize that it's historic. It's not a myth. And of course it has a mythical uh, uh, mythical trappings to it, uh, but uh, it was it it was written. It was a story that was written during a historical time period in which the Assyrian Empire was uh, was powerful, a formidable force in the world. Eventually, though, it, it, Assyria and uh, and uh, its empire would fall, would be conquered by uh, Babylon and the Medes about 612 B.C. So. But so, so it had to take place well before 612 B.C. Now, the, the, the geo geographical locations, well, uh, this doesn't show up as well as I'd like, but um, you've, got, you've got Israel right there and Joppa. Uh, you've got Tarshish, which is literally the end of the earth <laughs> back then. Um, and you've got Nineveh, which is about 400 kilometers or, or miles, I should say, and into... Um, it's the modern day Iraq, if that can help you. And so you got Joppa. This is where the story starts. And for those of you who need a refresher, he gets in the boat uh, and heads towards Tarshish in direct disobedience to the word of the Lord, which came to him to go to Nineveh. Uh, he gets interrupted along the way. A big giant sea creature swallows him and... Well, that's the end of the chapter one, so we'll, uh, we'll stop at that point. But he does eventually get to, to Nineveh. Um, let's go. Let's go. Here, skipping ahead here a little bit. A little about the Ninevites and uh, the Syrians in general. They were a brutal, 
merciless, merciless people. Uh, one example of this is that they would take their prisoners alive and they'd make them build, their, build them walls. You know, wall building was a big part of, of security then. And, and then for their, you know, their, their thanking them, they would then put them alive inside the walls. They would seal them into the live, in, alive. And they would be, of course, hanging out of the walls. And this would be a, a vivid <laughs> reminder to any would-be enemies that this is what's going to happen to you if you don't, uh, unless you... Um, uh, unless you resist us. And so their, their wickedness was l legendary. And uh, that perhaps was a pretty tame example. Uh, and during the zenith of the power, they had, they had I conquered Iraq, uh, Syria, Jordan, and Lebanon. But here's an understatement bringing us back into Jonah. The Assyrians were a thorn in the side of Israel. And so it's no wonder that J Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. But we really don't know why. We don't, we don't, we're not told. He's he just said, no, I'm not going. I'm going to Tarshish. We'll find out actually a little more why. And it might surprise you why he doesn't want to go over the next few weeks. But, uh, you know, of course, Assyria was used by God to chasten Israel. But they had performed, <laughs> overperformed that role and abused the Israelites. And they were not only like Israel in, in line for judgment, uh, as we see here, uh, they were, of course, um, what did it say here? They, they were, their evil has come up. They were a, a great and evil nation. So, um, yeah, which reminds us that, you know, nations are, are under God's scrutiny. You know that? He keeps a list. Uh, and his, his patience wears thin. It happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. It happened to Assyria. Can it happen to a modern day nation? Who's to say it can't? So uh, as we look at this text, we see its relevance even today in that area. But let's raise the need. Um, again, it's timeless. It's, it's timeless because what you have here is it's a story about a world gone crazy. And again, not unlike our world today, especially in the light of the events of this last week. Um, Israel... Back then, God's chosen people, Israel, this, now his chosen people, uh, I do not feel safe. <laughs> they did not feel safe. Against, again, they had been brought under the, the, the judgment of God, and, and they had deserved this. But uh, at, at times, they were able to resist Assyria. They were able to resist Assyria, um, especially in the, in the south, in Judah. And so, uh, but there was this general malaise, this, this general fear that, that, that there was no security. You never knew. Can you imagine living like that? Can you imagine if Canada was, uh, hated us? You know, eh? You know, they're, they're, they're nice folks up there, very nice. They don't hate us, but I mean, they used to. I grew up on the border with Canada, and there's, there's historic events where the the British back then, would come into the Americans. And they, they burned the town I grew up in, Lewiston, New York. They burned it to the ground. You know, imagine living with that fear of never knowing how safe you are. Some of you know that very well. Some of you know that fear very well in this room. So it was a, it was a crazy time. Where, where, where was God in all this? So the text is describing a crazy world, as you'll see, and, and maybe in, in, in surprising ways here. Let's look at the characters. How many characters are there? There's Jonah, of course. There's God. We'll start with God. There's Jonah. There's these, uh, this is just chapter one. There's the mariners, and then uh, a really big fish, a really big fish. And let me say, every one of these, with the exception of God, behaves unexpectedly in a way, in an opposite way in which you might expect them to believe. And, and the book itself is unusual. You know, of the 12 minor prophets, usually a prophetic book, you have a prophet hearing the word of God and then going to the people and, you know, giving the word. This story is about a prophet. And a not, very, a flat, not a flattering portrayal at all. In a nutshell, what is this book about? It's the story of a prophet who hates God because he loves his enemies. Wow. I'll read that again. I'll say that again. This is a story of a prophet who hates God because he loves his enemies. Well, let's start. Let's, get, let's dig in here. Uh, chapter 1, verse 1. I hope you're there. I hope you have a Bible to follow along. Um, I'll try the best I can to keep things going. I never know what's going to happen here, but uh, I'll try to keep it going. Uh, actually, 
Just remember, can you keep the, the slides going? Corresponding to where we're at. Start with verses 1 through 3. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it, for the evil has, for evil, their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. So here you got crazy world. For starters, you got a prophet who won't prophesy uh, and actually rebels against God and foolishly thinks he can actually run away from God. Um, now, so if Jonah won't listen to the word of God, uh, maybe he might listen to the wind of God, right? So what happens next? Picking up here. But the Lord hurled, verse 4, but the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, the sailors were afraid, and each, uh, out, uh, each cried out sorry, to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship in, into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and laid down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, what do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God, and perhaps the, the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. Well, apparently he, he's not listening to God or to the wind of God. He's asleep. Now, look at these sailors. These sailors are, are counterintuitive to the, to, the, to, the, uh, to the stereotype you might have of a sailor. You know, most sailors we think of as well, you know, cussing and getting drunk types, um, not religious. But here, they're, they're, they're hearing the word of God loud and clear. They know what's going on here. They know that, well, they don't know the God yet, but they know that God is the cause, a prime mover uh, for their great distress. This is they were, they were afraid. The prophet, on the other hand, who is supposed to be in touch with God, is sound asleep. His phone is on, do not disturb. This is a strange world, strange, disparate world. And their, dis their desperation is growing as the, as the waves grow in size. Pick up now in verse 7. And they said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Again, incredibly astute. <laughs> uh, sailors who would uh, you'd not necessarily think they are They're, they they see what's going on, and and Jonah also gets 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 the uh, the message. By the way, this idea of casting lots was was a biblical thing. It was it was something that was practiced in the ancient near, ancient Near East, uh, ancient world to discern the will of God. So they're they're in the process of trying to find out. They, they recognize the cause, and now they want to understand how to, how to, over, how to, how to, how to get, uh, how to make sure that uh, this, this situation changes for the better. And so, uh, they're suddenly very interested in Jonah because, of course, the law falls to him. Verse 8, and they said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. And then there's these 50 questions. What is your occupation? Where did you come from? What is your country? Of what people are you in which point um, <laughs> you get this rather joke of a response. I, I'm a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the land. No, Jonah, you do not fear the Lord. <laughs> if you feared the Lord, you would have obeyed him. That's what the fear of the Lord means, to obey the Lord, to, 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 li to live according to his plan and countenance him in all your decisions making. So no, he's not fearing the Lord. The only ones who are fearing the Lord are, again, these, these pagans, these sailors who you wouldn't expect. Let's pick up here in verse 10. Uh, then the men were exceedingly afraid now at this point, And they said, what is this you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had actually told them previously. Again, you had this prophet who uh, is supposed to fear the Lord, not fearing the Lord. And the pagans in the process are justifiably very, very afraid. So, at this point, you know, you're thinking, how do sailors handle their, their problems? Uh, what would a good pirate on the 
pearl, the black pearl, in the, peri on the, in the Pirates of the Caribbean do? He'd, th he'd throw the schmuck overboard, right? Not these pirates. These pirates were nice, gentlefolk, soft-hearted. I mean, what do they do? Let's pick up here, verse 11. And then they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may quiet us down? For the sea had grown more and more tempestuous. Tem temp tempestuous, easy for me to say. He said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of thee that this great tempest has come upon you. What, so what is the response of the pagans, of these or, or, pirate types? Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to get back to dry land. But they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life. Let, lay, and lay not, us, lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. Wow, theologians, these sailors, this is a crazy, messed up world. And of course then, they pick up Jonah, verse 15, and hurl him into the sea, and immediately what happens? The sea ceased from its raging. And then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered sacrifice to the Lord. They thanked him and worshiped him. Jonah, in the meanwhile, is, is, is so determined not to obey God. You know, his plan A did not work. Obviously, going to Tar Tarshish did not work. So now he's got plan B. What's his plan B? <laughs> he's going to commit suicide by letting them throw him into the sea. And how did that work for old Jonah? Fail again. Verse 17, and the Lord appointed a great fish to, so uh, to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. This is bizarre. Everybody acting out of character. Sailors who you'd expect to be immoral are actually kind people with repentant hearts. And a God-chosen prophet who doesn't care about people? What kind of prophet is he? He hates people. He hates God because God loves people. And now he's trying to take his own life. Again, it's, it's reverse world. It's upside down world. Opposite world, bizarro world, however you want to put it. And Jer 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 Jonah's little sermon, what a joke. You, you really think you can run from God and believe that stuff? Of course you can't. If, if all this is true, why be stupid and run from God? You can't escape. That's what we read earlier in Psalm 139. Where can I run or escape from your presence? Wherever I go, you are with me. But then a funny thing happened as he attempted suicide. He didn't succeed because God is God, and that's the way things are. That's the way things are. Even if it doesn't appear as if he is God, that's the way things are. Even as it appears as his will is being thwarted, rejected by men, and you look around you, that's the way it appears. God is still in charge today. In Jonah, in this bizarro world where nobody's doing what you'd expect, God keeps getting things back on track. It takes a miracle or two, actually ten. If there's ten miracles in here, by the way, if you want to do the, do the math. But God is at work. And God is at work today. You know, if you're like me, you know, I, you know I'm deeply moved by what's happening in Israel. So, so much suffering, so much misery, sadness, more to come. But even... We know, we, can, we believe this, that God is at work and he is appointing a rescuer for his people. He has not forgotten Israel. He is still accomplishing his other purpose of reaching the world. He wants to reach the Palestinians too. God's plans and purposes will not be full. Israel of old was supposed to expand the kingdom. This was, this was God telling them to do this. Bring the kingdom to the, to the pagan, wicked nation of, of Assyria. What did they do? Well, if Jonah's any indication, they had nothing to do with that. Of course, God has always intended to adopt the Gentiles, that's you and me, into his family. And that, that plan will not be thwarted. It's happening. It's happening. So God sent his son to, to accomplish it. He had to send his son. Jonah did, didn't work. He sent his apostles. And he sent his disciples right now to make more disciples, teaching Whoever will believe to obey all things. For lo, he is with us until the end of the age. 
You know, as we continue studying these next two chapters, next three chapters, God's searchlight will focus in on our hearts and it'll expose the sin of our hearts, most likely, because, you know, it's easy to hate. It's easy to hate Hamas. And, of course, we, we hate the sin, but we are called to love the sinner. And so, again, we pray. We pray for the peace of Israel, of Jerusalem, and we pray for her enemies. We pray and seek the good of all God's people, even his enemies, especially his enemies. And so our world has gone crazy. It's a bizarro world. <laughs> but let me tell you, things are not as they seem. There is what we can see, yes, and it seems crazy. We try to figure it out, and we <laughs> seem to have more questions than answers. But there, is what that, but there is what God is doing around us, through us, and in us, and we can trust him that he's using us here or wherever. What does this tell us about the character of God? It tells us he's tenacious. You can't, he won't take no for an answer. He doesn't lose his way, change his mind. We may rebel against his express purpose, but his pervert purpose will prevail. Scott and May, I, I, I sowed you into this sermon uh, this morning because I knew you were coming. You told me last night. But you know, God is a God of mercy. He calls us to show mercy, and and uh, you know I just want to pray a blessing on on you as you as you start your ministry, because you're going into the world into the the world of South Philly, preaching reconciliation to a world at rebellion with God, and uh, He promises to use His gospel word to open hearts, to bring about faith, to show glory, to show His glory in it. I think God is most uh, pleased when, uh, most enjoys it when he saves the most wicked among us. Or at least those who realize they're most wicked. Like you and I, we are no better than the Ninevites. Our sin is different, but it is nonetheless worse. I have to end. I'm out of time here. But let's pray. I uh, had a few more points to make. And I'll save that for next time. Father, we thank you today that you are a work in our world. And though it doesn't seem like it, it doesn't seem like it, this small gathering today and just the, the disinterest that's out there, the apathy, the antipathy, the, the, the hatred for you, Father, we just, uh, we see that and we, um, we don't know what to make of it except to trust you more, trust you more through it all. So, Father, I ask, Lord, that you would continue to do your work and your purpose through us and through Scott and May, Lord, we pray a blessing on their ministry as they begin their church plant uh, above, broad, and just around South Philly, wherever you take them. Just pray, Father, that uh, you, by your gospel that your power would be would be known and, and seen. Father, we just uh, pray for ourselves, Lord, that we not grow weary in well-doing, that even as we struggle to make heads or tails of what's going on in this crazy world, then we know that you're in control. We thank you for that reality. Praise Jesus' name. Amen. Again, I have gone long. Shame on me. We're not going to sing a final hymn. Um, just a few announcements quickly, if you would. Okay, a few announcements. Um, some of us that made us, we have a um, um, refugee um, in, in Philadelphia who's gone missing. So just want you to take a look at his face. His name is Mark, um, missing from South Philly um, near here. Uh, the Powell Rec Center is right at 7th and, 7th and, um, and Snyder. So he's from this neighborhood. Um, so if you happen to see him, please call the police. Um, we're still, right, Simon, they're still looking for him. They have